This guy's a very polite eater. A baby mink is abandoned on a pet store shelf. He's very well behaved. A young coyote has a nasty case of mange. I have had mange twice, and it is awful. It drives you absolutely crazy, so I really feel for these guys. And how do you feed a snake with an injured jaw? I don't want to tube him or force feed him, though. I don't want to mess with his jaw. It's known as the city within a park. The greater Toronto area is home to one of the most diverse urban wildlife populations in North America. Here, more than 6 million busy humans live alongside 350 different species of wild animals. When wildlife clashes with urban life, it's usually the animals who lose. That's when Toronto Wildlife Centre steps in, saving animals one day at a time. In the big city, you're more likely to see a mink on someone's back than roaming through the downtown streets. But the greater Toronto area is actually home to a healthy population of these semi-aquatic weasels. In fact, there may be eight or more minks per every square kilometer. Oh, there's a mink. <gasps> Unfortunately, that doesn't make them any easier to spot. They're experts at hiding out in the city's many rivers and marshes. Which is why a Bowmanville pet store owner was shocked to find an unfamiliar baby animal crying out on the empty pet store shelf. She quickly rushed it into Toronto Wildlife Center. So just a couple of days ago, we had a tiny little animal brought in. We're pretty sure it's a mink from what we can tell. It's, it's really, really hard to identify species sometimes when they're so incredibly young. Natalie Carvonen is the center's founder and executive director. This poor little thing was found by someone and just left behind in a pet store on a shelf. At this stage, a baby mink needs a lot of care and almost hourly feedings. Toronto Wildlife Centre is a charity-funded organization, and overnight volunteers are hard to come by. So Natalie will have to work overtime to keep this little guy's needs met. I'm going to be fostering him this coming weekend. It's good that it's coming over the weekend because at this age, he needs to be fed about every couple of hours, really pretty much throughout the entire day um, and when they're so little and vulnerable the, the more frequent tiny little feedings we can give them the easier it is on their system as they get used to this very strange artificial formula. The mink took to the formula and is growing nicely. Now at five weeks old this baby mink is able to survive on fewer feedings a day but he isn't ready to hunt for himself. So Lisa Fosco, the rehabilitation manager at Toronto Wildlife Centre, still has to play mom. Here we have a baby mink, and we have had him since he was a few days old. You can smell his musk, and he is one of our favorites, just because we've raised him from a little guy, and he's been doing really, really well. This guy's a very polite eater. He may be polite now, but this could be a big problem. He's very well behaved. Good manners don't go very far in nature. Lisa wants him to be much more aggressive. It's a critical part of his success in the wild, and it's not going to happen with too much human coddling. So this mink will be getting a little space. So these guys tend to stay in an area that nobody comes in here unless we're going to be feeding them. We never want them to see us any more than they have to. With any wild animal, it's going to be important to keep them in a nice quiet room just so that we don't stress them out. Minimal handling is the key. It's a technique employed at the center to make sure animals don't bond with humans. They need to go out there and understand that, that humans are their primary predator. Until he gets this message, he'll be staying at the center. Oh, this guy will be in captivity for another uh, probably eight weeks. Right now we're trying to talk to other rehabilitators to see if anybody else has a single mink his size because we'd like to give him a friend at this age so that they can grow up together. They grow up by themselves. They don't have the same social development. And while we can't really tell the differences, we assume that in the wild the other minks can. We want them to be able to interact normally with the others of their kind. The center hasn't been able to find a match for him yet, so it's up to Lisa and her team to turn this baby into a full-fledged wild mink. Okay. All right, I'll see you in three hours, mink. 
Meanwhile, Andrew White, head of the rescue and release team at Toronto Wildlife Centre, has just returned from an urgent call at a local school. Well, we've just come back from a rescue of a young coyote pup who actually had been suspected, suspectedly chased through a schoolyard um, by a dog and the school doors just happened to be open and the little pup ran into there. It has a uh, mange, which is a horrible skin parasite um, that really, really agitates them and he's scratched himself so hard that it's, it's rubbed him raw in places. Our biggest concern is now that we have this guy is there's probably a couple more out there. While Andrew sets out to find the remaining sick coyote pups, Katie and Aaron are in the assessment room. You said he didn't eat anything overnight, right? Right, completely untouched. Okay, I think I just want to give him some canned food this morning with no meds in it. Sure. And see if he eats it, um, and then, because he only gets his meloxicam at night. Okay. Um, so if he doesn't eat anything by tonight, we can hand feed him a bit tonight sure. with his meds. Yeah. So he just needs fluids and his antibiotics this morning. Okay. And then I would like to run him, if we can, and just check for a limp. Sure, um, we can set up that kennel cab. Yeah, because yesterday on intake he did the, the typical coyote thing where he went from lying on his side to cowering in the back and I didn't actually see him walk at all. Um, but he reportedly had a limp according to the finder, so uh, if, if we can get him to walk that'd be nice. Sure, okay. Yeah, this is the sore Andrew was talking about, but you can see he has them sort of all over. Yeah. So, it's a girl, I should say her, her legs. She has big one up there and on this side too. Mange is a parasitic skin disease caused by mites. It's itchy and uncomfortable, and it makes the infected animals scratch patches of their skin raw. Those bare and scratched patches of skin are vulnerable to infection, so antibiotics are the first order of business. Yeah, yeah she's getting oral antibiotics. If left untreated, the infection would have eventually attacked the coyote's immune system, okay. making it too weak to care for itself. Not very inflamed, at least. No, not very inflamed. Well, she, she's also already had one dose of anti-inflammatories and antibiotics, so I'm sure that that helps. She doesn't have that. Aaron and Katie can tell the mange is still in its early stages. That's good news for this coyote pup. She looks good. Um, it's pretty typical mange, I would say. She has the skin sores and the, the thin fur and whatnot, but her eyes look great. Okay. Nice and clear, good color, um, very bitey. <laughs> I appreciate that. And we'll just see if she has that limp. Yeah. I don't see any limp. going to avoid the cab entirely. Okay. Yeah. You want a glove? Oh, never mind. Perfect. With the assessment complete, the treatments for mange will begin. And Katie is feeling positive about her prognosis. Her mange is not that bad. She doesn't look very great, I know, but she is not even close to the worst that we see. And mange is so easily treatable. I have had mange twice, and it is awful. It drives you absolutely crazy. So I really feel for these guys. After the initial treatment, the mites begin to die off and the itchiness subsides almost immediately. But the staff at the center are still concerned. There's a chance that this young coyote may be carrying a deadly virus. Lisa has been unable to find a pal for this lone mink since he was dropped off at the center four weeks ago. He's been doing well, he's growing well, he looks good. He's up for his weight check, so we're gonna look at his weight and look at his, his behavior. He's been alone too long. Without a companion, he might miss learning some important social cues, like how to be an aggressive animal. A mild-mannered mink will not do well in the wild. In all honesty, last week I was starting to get very concerned because I was able to reach my hand in there, and that should never happen. So what happens if the mink doesn't start putting up a stink? If we have an animal that can't be released into the wild, there's two options. One of them is to place them in a permanent captive situation somewhere, and the other one is euthanasia. Um, you know, and as much as that's not something we would want to do, to be really honest with you, finding a home for a wild animal is very rare. It's those terrible options that motivate Lisa to turn this mild animal into a wild animal. 
I'm just a little bit concerned about him because we've had him so long by himself. Um, so what I want to do is let's see how bitey he is, how hard he is to grab, how aggressive he is. If he's not, then we have to look at adjusting our plan. Okay. Hopefully he'll try to kill me and then we won't have anything to worry about. That would be amazing. The more aggression this mink shows toward Lisa, the better his chances are to be successfully released into the wild. Anything less will mean prolonged captivity at best and possibly something much, much worse. Okay. He's trying to kill me for real, so he's better than I thought. All right, I'm sorry. So I'm actually very impressed. <laughs> he's wilding up nicely. All right, buddy, I'm sorry. I am so much happier than I was last week. Okay, good. So he is now at his next category um, of development. He bit me for real, he must. That's exactly what we wanna see, that's great. Okay. Despite this positive checkup, the mink is not out of the woods yet. Next, he goes outside into his big boy cage. He'll be out there for maybe two to three weeks, then be released. Body Meanwhile, the rescue team has captured a second coyote pup, also suffering from a serious case of mange. The two pups appear close enough in age that the center would like to keep them together while they heal. Lisa and head veterinarian Heather Reed are getting ready to examine these new coyote pups for signs of any further illness. So it's crated. After a recent scare with a very sick fox, Heather wants to make sure these animals are cleared for the virus. A young coyote? A while back we had um, a young fox, kind of a similar age as our coyotes, that came in and turned out to have a pretty bad infectious disease. It had um, parvovirus, which causes a really bad diarrhea and a um, very sick animal. So of course that's always at the back of our mind when we get these sick uh, orphans in. Canine parvovirus can be a deadly and infectious disease when it attacks young pups. If either of these coyotes has this virus, chances are they'll need to be euthanized and the center's animal population will be at risk. Yeah, I've just peeked at her quickly, haven't done a full assessment. Okay, so. so the main concern was that she came in orphaned? Young plus mange. And we think she's eating on her own? Yeah, they said that she ate everything but the dry food, which is good. Yeah, that's good. Um, so I'm thinking that we look at her, that we okay. look at the other one. Geographically, they can go together. Ah, oh, that would be great. Yeah, so I think that if we can clear them medically to go together, I think that the best medicine is a friend at this age. Okay, no, there's no wounds or anything. Oh, not that I could feel or see. Her little, <clears throat> these spots are even good. Yeah. Okay. Great. Walking nicely. Okay, great. So, um, we got a fecal sample on her. Yep. So maybe if we look at the other one and get another fecal, yep, you can check them out. The first pup gets the all clear. Now it's on to the next. All right. It's okay. Can you see a dentition? Dentition has to do with the way teeth are arranged in the mouth. It helps determine an animal's age. Uh, the lower, she looks like she's got the same dentition, canines and incisors. If I can just can't see her upper incisors yet. So she's, it's okay, it's okay. Over her back is where the, the wound was and the fur is missing. Looks a lot better today here. Okay. Great. Great. So I think that I think that they are. I mean, as long as yeah, as long as the, we figure out about the parasites and every, um, you know, I think that they can definitely go together in this room. This is a much bigger room and be great. So run the samples. If it's not, even if they have different parasites, can we just treat them, put them together? I think so. We we'll just know what to treat them with, and then we'll uh, get them. Okay. Hopefully set up today. You think we can get them in here today? I think so. We can redo the cage. They're nocturnal, so they've got all day. Yeah. And then before evening, we'll put them together. Yeah. No, I think it'll work out. That's that's it's good that we've got to the same age. I think it's great. It's actually pretty lucky. It's the best news. Not only do these coyote pups not have parvo, they both get to have a new friend. The great thing is that these guys are eating on their own, they um, do not have a fever, and they do seem to be overall 
um, a lot healthier. They, they do have the, the skin parasites, but they don't seem to have the systemic infection that the other um, fox had. So uh, we're always thinking about that, but in this case, I think we're pretty sure that um, this is not a problem for, for these coyotes. They're gonna be here for a while. They've gotta regrow their fur. Um, they have to get a little bit nutritionally caught up and then they'll go to our outdoor pen and be able to grow and to be wild coyotes um, together in a nice enclosure outside. Things are looking up for the coyote pups, but it's a little less rosy for the next patient. Lisa is about to examine a tiny snake with a possible head injury, but the information on his chart doesn't add up. Okay, I have a little issue with people saying he ate two mealworms. <laughs> I just can't believe it. <laughs> Two phoenix worms, four mealworms, two wax worms, and one butter worm. One of the staff members at Toronto Wildlife Centre found this snake under a wood pile on her property. When she took a close look, she could see that there was blood on the side of his head. So she brought him into the centre for an assessment. When he came in, he had a little bit of a head tilt. He had some swelling, he had some blood, and he had an abrasion on the inside of his mouth. The first step is to establish whether this guy has eaten anything since he got here. We generally, what we do is we give them a very specific amount where we count out the individual worms or bugs or whatever we're feeding them. Um, for this guy, we've, we're feeding him four different kinds of worms. And so right now what I'm doing is just counting what's remaining based on, you know, compared to what we gave him. So we try to just be really cautious to make sure that we're counting well. You know, I'd like to see him eat before determining whether or not he's releasable just because of where the injury is. But at the same time, being a snake, he could choose not to eat for a month or two. Um, what we try to do is we keep their temperature at their optimal range and their humidity at the optimal level and that will generally encourage them to eat, but I can't make him eat. That comes back to us of whether or not he's not eating because of his injury or because he just doesn't want to eat in captivity. So that's one of the challenges with working with these guys. That means this little snake's health is still a big mystery. At Toronto Wildlife Centre, every animal is cared for by a team of rehabilitation experts and veterinarians, as well as vet techs and a slew of support crew who feed, clean, and care for the animals. Sometimes it takes a few people to determine something simple like how much food did this snake eat for breakfast? Okay, so I don't know. I handled him quickly yesterday just to see how his reaction time was. I'm not convinced that he's eaten anything. Aaron was the supervisor who first admitted this tiny snake. There's more sample here if you want it, Lisa. Yes, I do. Something went in at some point. On your hand? Oh, oh yeah. A little bit of blood. Well, sorry he messed eye. up his paperwork, but I'm happy to have the sample. Just a little concerned about some possible blood in that left eye. Seems to be a little bit darker. His jawbones look perfect. Yeah, the alignment was always fine. Just had a little spot of blood both on the maxilla and a little spot down by the margin of the mandible. Looks great. Yeah, I'm happy. Okay, <clears throat> can I palpate his skull? Sure, this is good to wait on him too before we put him back. I need to de-glove. I can't feel him very well. Um, so, you know, we generally wear gloves. I'll just wash my hands, but um, to feel the little bones in his skull, I just want to make sure that I'm getting Good palpation. Oh, he's swollen right here. I didn't feel that with the glove. Small spot of blood exists in the inner margin of left mandible. Yeah, I can feel it right here under his left mandible. It's minor. I mean, I, so my thought is that we hold him another day or two and then just feel it again. Like, I mean, I couldn't even feel that through latex. It's that subtle. Sure. So maybe we recheck him in, in like two days because we've got a nice weather window. Sure. Okay. I just want to get a weight on him before we put him back. Yeah, get a weight and then I'll run his lab sample. Come on, buddy. 12.3. He's down. I don't want to tube him or force feed him, though. I don't want to mess with his jaw. Okay. Okay. So, it looks great. While some animals would probably stay away from the woodpile after an experience like this one, Aaron is not hopeful this little snake has learned his lesson. We can keep our fingers crossed. Time for the mink. It's the big day for the center's one and only mink. 
After but eight weeks at Toronto Wildlife Centre, it's finally down. time for him to be released. Be but they have to draft. catch him first. So he's in his igloo, but don't catch him right away because I'd like to see his behavior. Yeah. I really like to see their behavior before the release just to, to verify that they've got all the equipment they need to be wild. Um, so I want to see, you know, some aggression and some fear to us being in its territory. And uh, I want to see that it's good at eluding being caught. Although I do want to catch it as quickly as possible. It looks beautiful. Yeah, he's right here. Yeah. He's huge. Wow. Beautiful. All right, let's get him. He looks great. It's Stacy's first time with a mink. And it looks like it's going to be up to her to catch him. He's right behind the igloo. If you go on the left of it, I'll scare him. And he might come right to you. Ready? Three, two, one. Ready? He's right. Go tighter. Tighter. Ready? Yeah. You want to just unravel him into the cage? From the net? Yeah. Yeah. One thing is clear. There are no longer any doubts about this mink's level of aggression. Uh, can you spin it once? Yeah. Like. Just go for it. Just do it. If we lose him, then we'll recatch him. Okay. The first try didn't work. At least now they're more prepared for take two. But so is this mink. Same plan. Is, okay, just cover it, cover it. This time we won't lock him in the net, we'll just smother him. Okay. I'll let you do the door. Overall, I think that went good. He shows that he's nice and wild and he certainly knows how to get away from predators being us. That's pretty impressive. Considering he started off, what, this big in our care? Yeah. Wow, that's so cool. Now, with the mink safely in his cage, it's time to set him free. Lisa has arrived with the mink at a spot close to where it was found as a tiny baby. This majestic pond is a mere five minutes drive from the store where this mink was originally discovered. But unlike the store shelf, this location couldn't be more perfect. It's okay, buddy. It's okay. And yet the mink is reluctant to leave the safety of his familiar towel. It's okay, buddy. Or Maybe it's Lisa. Somehow, cradled in his towel, this otherwise aggressive mink appears much less threatening. After all, he's only ever known the shelter of Toronto Wildlife Centre. Now it's up to him to make this new habitat his home. Just as it looks like he's ready to go forward, he comes back to his towel one more time. <laughs> and then finally he disappears into the thicket. But Lisa isn't ready to leave just yet. She stays for one last look. 
When releasing animals, uh, we worry about how they're going to do. You know, have we done our job properly? But when we have gotten to the point where we do feel confident that they will survive and we've done the best we can, then that's such a great feeling. You know, the animals that have had to overcome the biggest obstacles to get back into the wild are definitely the most rewarding, for sure.